thank you for joining us today for this fireside chat on edge AI development. I'm joined by some pretty amazing people. We have Sek, the CTO and co-founder of Layton AI, and Curtin Graham, who we're about to introduce in a moment as technical advisors to the firm. I first met Layton AI at SRI International after you know, serving for 10 years as an advisory board member for tech spinouts that they were doing, everything from Siri to Layton AI. And, uh, and I led the first investment around in Layton AI. Uh, I've been an active investor myself in Edge AI, from dedicated silicon companies like Mythic, doing analog ML chip processors to edge security and end applications and everything from agriculture to healthcare. Um, so I'm a big fan of what Leighton AI is doing and uh, excited to be the moderator for today's discussion. So today we are joined by three amazing people. So Kurt Kaiser is a professor at Graduate School at Berkeley. He received his PhD in computer science from Indiana University and worked at at and Bell Labs and later Synopsys where he was CTO. In 88, excuse me, in 98, he joined UC Berkeley uh, to focus on this research where he's a highly cited author. And he um, has also been an angel investor and advisor at about 25 startup companies and co-founded DeepScale, which was acquired by Tesla, a company I used to serve on the board of um, back in 2019. Graham Taylor is a professor of University of Gulf, we can wave at you as well. And he's also research director at the Institute of Artificial AI, the Vector Institute, that is, of, Art of, of AI. And he got his PhD in CS as well from the University of Toronto, where Jeffrey Hinton, of course, is a luminary and he's an advisor to um, his uh, PhD work. And his research in, uh, intersects machine learning and high performance computing, uh, specifically finding better ways to leverage hardware accelerators for large scale machine learning. That turns out, by the way, something you guys don't know this, but I started a PhD in the exact same subject, broadly defined, in 1988. Uh, looking at parallel uh, processing hardware to accelerate machine learning, but luck, or neural nets as we called them at the time, but luckily put that aside for a few decades before returning as an investor. <laughs> it's a little early. Um, Zach, who is from Leighton AI, is a CTO there and co-founder. And previously he was a technical director at SRI International and prior to that at Motorola Labs. He got his PhD at Georgia Tech uh, and he's focused on optimizing tools to democratize edge AI, which is all about what we're here to talk about today. So let's start with talking about what we mean by edge AI and why it's important. So if I start with a high level question, something broad, why in your opinion, do we need edge AI? Why is that a thing? And how does that relate to the work you've done the research that you're doing in machine learning optimization? So either Kurt or Graham, whoever would like to go first. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm, my whole career is focused on, on efficient algorithms and efficient computation. And, and so in some sense, I'm I'm agnostic about where uh, computations occur. I've done a lot of work on accelerating both machine learning and deep learning uh, for the cloud. Um, but we move to the edge uh, because we need predictable latency. Uh, we need availability. Uh, my cell phone goes out twice on a 15 minute drive from Berkeley campus to my home. Um, I think we're, we're getting growing concerns about privacy. You know, I don't really like the fact that that Alexa pipes up and says things that I don't think she should know. Um, and uh, that, that lack of privacy also leads to lack of security. So, and, you know, there are many more data breaches than I think we're aware of, and those that we are aware of uh, give us a lot of pause. So I, I think there's there's plenty of reason to, to move those computations away from the cloud and to the edge. What I'll add to that, then, uh, of course, I agree with Kurt's comments around uh, privacy and, and security related issues of operating on the cloud. Uh, I, I'd also like to integrate with some of the, the research projects that I'm, I'm, I'm doing right now and interested in. These are happening uh, in, in areas where we can't actually connect uh, to the cloud. So uh, something I'm very passionate about uh, these days is a project related to biodiversity. So. You know, as, as many as 1 million species face extinction right now, and AI could be the key to their survival and our survival as a, as a human species. So we're trying to be able to count the diversity of life out uh, in, in very remote environments where we're able to do cloud connection. And I think there's a number of interesting applications that we may be able to talk about today, uh, whether it's from water monitoring uh, to, um, you know, helping people in, in, uh, in, in, in urban environments where they don't have good connectivity uh, go about their daily lives. So that idea of um, not being able to be constantly connected to the cloud is, is a very motivating one for me in some of our research. That's a really good point. So if I recap what I've heard here, we can think of the edge as, you know, those places that are out at the edge of the network, the edge of survival, a phone, a car, a camera. And why might you want local intelligence, latency, quick response time, 
uh, availability. If you don't have access to the cloud, you know, always up, always available and privacy slash security, your data is local. It's not being sent to who knows whom uh, on your television or other uh, devices you might have in your home snooping on you. Um, you started, uh, Graham, to talk about applications and maybe we can hear from Kurt or Sec and others as well. What are some of the killer apps for these needs? Uh, if we think about putting a little brain in everything, if you will. I'll, I'll kind of start off uh, with things that we, we might not even think about that, but it's important for the kind of global kind of settings, right? Sustainability mm -hmm. uh, is kind of main topics in, in a lot of uh, kind of new tech startups and in a lot of industry are adopting that, right? So from, from the kind of edge devices and IoT, there's a lot of applications that can be applied there, but simply stating, right? If, if we see we are rolling out uh, billions of these edge devices, it would be nice to put them in a form factor that is optimal or as efficient as we can, just from a sustainability perspective, right? So things are not necessarily uh, just data privacy, uh, getting to devices that you can't reach, but just from a sustainability and, and doing a good with AI, uh, it's also important, right? I'll start with that and, and maybe uh, Kurt and, and Graham can also chime in. Well, I think I think we're, we are going to see intelligence everywhere um, in our homes and our vehicles and our workplaces and the infrastructure that we, we move through and drive through the buildings that we're in and so forth. Um, and I, I kind of organize, you know, the, the um, these different applications around those that are driven by latency availability, availability and predictability, which, which Steve reiterated um, and automotive is obviously uh, a place where we're, we're seeing a lot of concentration as we try to move from, you know, multiple kilowatts in a, in a robo taxi to something you can put in a passenger car. There, there's, there's a lot of demands there. Uh, drones, um, mobile consumer apps are not something you think should necessarily be untethered. But, you know, I think Facebook was among the first to realize that, 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 that uh, teenagers don't want to don't wait for the cloud to add stickers to their photos. You know, they, they want that instant gratification. And then there, there are applications like satellites, which, which have absolute demand. Um, then driving by privacy or driven more by privacy, I think there's um, home, office, car. I, I want to feel that I'm private and secure in those places, but I still want to be able to give verbal commands. I still want my car to, to be used, the ADAS features and so forth. Um, and inside outside surveillance. So there's, those are again, also driven by, I, I want that, I want that information captured, but I want to keep it private. My lab, we worked with a, a, a very cool startup now a little bit larger. It's a few years down the road called Swift Medical. Uh, based out of Toronto, and they were doing uh, monitoring of wound care. So, and they were doing this on phones. So, right now, in terms of monitoring wounds like bed sores or uh, ulcers associated with diabetes, for example, it's done in a very laborious uh, way. It's kind of gross, so I won't get into the details. Uh, but effectively, they're measuring wounds with with rulers and very manually. Uh, and this was completely automated and w using using uh, computer vision uh, uh, and, and deep learning models. And uh, they've completely automated this, this process, and now they're in an, a number of long-term care facilities. So it's those sorts of uh, distributed mm -hmm. healthcare applications respecting uh, privacy and security that that I'm interested in. We have certainly many more of those out there. And then I I'm also interested in um, you know going back to environmental e examples. There's a team called Blue Lion Labs uh, out of Waterloo, Ontario, uh, as part of the Next AI program, they're doing water quality monitoring, uh, looking for harmful alg algae, algae blooms. Uh, and again, doing this in underwater environments, right, where you might not have uh, good connectivity. Um, just re read about an art article right now on um, a group at University of uh, Alberta doing water quality monitoring at a water treatment plant out in uh, rural uh, remote com communities. Uh, and uh, that was done with reinforcement learning. So there's a number of different kinds of uh, AI machine learning alg algorithms that can be run on these devices. Um, I'm also very excited about cons consumer tech, exactly what, what, what Kurt is saying. Um, one of the ones that hasn't been mentioned is, is perhaps uh, physical gaming experiences. So people would do video gaming right now on their own, but there's an opportunity. Uh, we did work many years ago on having physical crowd gaming experiences. And I think with the kinds of wearable devices, uh, we could create all kinds of different uh, entertainment type of experiences with uh, AI vision and, and uh, uh, edge computing. Yeah, just real quick, I, I forgot to mention virtual reality, I think is, is going to be a, 
a, a really uh, big driver. And you know you, that untethered uh, headset, like we have in the Oculus Quest family now, is, is I think what people want. And that that's a very challenging application. Yeah, I think if we can imagine all the things we'd like to be intelligent in terms of end applications, it would crush the internet if that was all done centrally in the cloud. It requires a peripheral nervous system, if you will, uh, pushing intelligence to the edge. It, it just physically couldn't be instantiated. Everything from every autonomous car trying to run remotely, not feasible. Every security camera doing all of its algorithms remotely. Uh, I, I can't imagine it. In fact, the CEO of NVIDIA summarized interestingly because they focus more on the training and the data center and the big chips, if you will, rather than the small edge devices. Uh, but nevertheless, the CEO concluded that in the near future, we'll see a trillion of these edge intelligences deployed everywhere in one of the largest booms of computation probably the world's ever seen. And again, he's not saying that in a self-serving way. It's indirect at best, but it's it's really a sea change that, that's afoot. And you can see the reasons why. I mean, the, the quantified self, the medical diagnoses, diagnoses, everything from dermatology, like literally having the camera and, and local computation figure out if, if something's serious enough to, get, to go in for you know, a closer look. So let's let's so we have a lot of applications, potentially one of the next great technology waves in certainly in AI, if not you know, computer science writ large. But let's talk about how it's done today. Uh, how are these things built and deployed? Specifically, uh, there's terms like ML ops or machine learning as a service. You know, how is it done today for the cloud? And how is that going to be different when we think about building and deploying at the edge, where there's some different constraints in the cloud, you know, training versus inference, or however you want to define the question. How is ML ops done today? How do you see it being done for the edge? So, I, I mean, I think the, the first thing that occurs to me, having, you know, work, work with the cloud, we have sponsors, Alibaba, Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook. Um, one of the first things you see is the difference in the application mix. Uh, you know, things that you thought no longer existed or were no longer used, like multi-layer perceptrons and so forth, are, are actually a dominant computational load for both Google and Facebook. Recommendation systems, NLP, uh, natural language, um, Computer vision is actually a minor application there. And training is at least as important as inference. Um, and that that mix um, leads you to, and the very large models associated with recommendations in NLU leads you to be a lot more concerned about parallel and distributed processing and so forth. So those are the concerns I see there. Um, at the edge, and we, we well, in, sorry, in terms of um, requirements, I think uh, accuracy, then comes always to the forefront. And you have service level agreements more often than you have absolute real-time requirements. Um, when we get to the edge, we have a very different optimization problem. We've got to meet accuracy, latency, and memory constraints. Those are, those are hard constraints. You just can't get around them. And then you're trying to minimize power and overall energy usage. So we, we could get, kind of get down to the to the details, the gears of exactly how you accomplish those. But but although the core computations are common between those, how you're doing them and what you're, you know, the constraints under which you're doing them are, are very different. Great. Notion, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'd love to jump in here because the notion of sort of multi-objective optimization and optimizing not just purely toward accuracy uh, resonates with uh, I saw Frank Hutter uh, from University of Freiburg uh, present, uh, I think two weeks now at Toronto Machine Learning Summit. So I'm going to take some of his ideas with giving him all credit uh, and point you towards that talk if anybody's interested in more detail. But it's, it's precisely how he described it as deep learning 1.0 and deep learning 2.0. And he said, you know, in traditional machine learning, as, as we know, we had people engineer features and deep learning automated that features and made it, you know, feature learning and machine learning end to end, and we're all familiar with that story um, as deep, you know, deep learning coming in, and this is deep learning 1.0. But what the issue with deep learning 1.0 is that you know, we require this expert to choose uh, architecture and hyperparameters, and it's very sort of heavy handed in this, this deep learning expert involved in this pipeline. And um, this is not a new story. I mean, Stephen Meredith wrote this blog post in 2016 was saying, you know, uh, architecture engineering is the new feature engineering. Uh, so we've been aware of this, but I, I personally don't feel we have made so much uh, progress in the last five years on, on streamlining this. So in, in, in terms of Hutter's Deep Learning 2.0, um, he argues end-to-end -end learning right now is, is, is optimizing predictive accuracy. Uh, it's not optimizing fairness or robustness or model calibration or interpretability of all these things. But Deep Learning 2.0 is really all about this sort of multi-objective 
optimization. So it requires auto ML, it requires meta-learning optimization in a rigorous way. And, and I think in my view, this is the future of ML ops, this sort of holistic um, uh, optimization of multiple objectives, including latency, uh, but it, it, the person or the expert is involved in a different way. They're sort of in, involved with defining these objectives, but they're not in, involved in the nitty gritty of the optimization. So it's, it's a much more automated uh, approach to deep learning. Yeah, Graham, I, I mean, I, I guess we need a little controversy in a, in a panel or even a, in a fireside chat. I mean, I, I think a lot of that exists today. Um, you know, uh, neural architecture search, um, you know, we're working with systems that are in their fifth generation already. Now, I think the challenge is, uh, and our disappointment is, as we try to roll those technologies out, is that it's, it's even fewer people can control a neural architecture search system, even though it's more automated than can design a neural net to begin with. Right, so the the the, tech, the core technology is there. The usability, I think, is 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 where the where the big question. Is. You, when you talk about search, do you mean search across hyperparameters and optimization and topologies, as in sort of a meta level of you know? Yeah. So or... so basically, anything that a that a um, manual uh, sorry a, a, a human being is doing as they manually design a neural net, uh, mm -hmm. including the, the number of layers, the channels per layers, the particular types of filters and so forth, um, as well as, as was mentioned, other uh, outer hyperparameters and, and even adaptation to domains, we're getting better and better at throwing all of that into a single integrated optimization and coming out with something, something sensible there. And even, even something that has you know, real latency information uh, and, and power and uh, I'm just reviewing papers for MLSYS and um, People are even starting to throw in hardware parameters. So you, we're getting where we can really co-design the 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 in-target hardware if you have control over that. If you're one of the few companies that can do that together with the neural net. So that's I mean that's all. I hope that gets your question, Stephen. That that's all in there. Again, sadly, rather than seeing a bigger rollout of that and more and more people do that, we're seeing actually a smaller and smaller peak of the pyramid of fewer and fewer people are actually able to puzzle their way through how to how to, how to use a tool like that. It's a, it's, I think that's a really good point. That and could this democratize that, where one could optimize right. as a service? Right. Yeah. I think the, yeah, the I, other interest. Yeah, sorry. The, the other interesting thing is all the the infrastructure, the networking, the hardware, the model themselves are also evolving. Right. So you have this moving target of sort. Mm -hmm. Any search or anything like that. But yeah. Graham, you were going to say. I was going to say I, I I actually agree with Kurt, Kurt's point from a research perspective, and and, and in terms of. Frank Hutter making these comments about deep learning 2.0. He's really talking about the developments in his group over the last five years or so that have done tremendous things like uh, hardware aware neural architecture search. And it, you know, it, from a research perspective, it's been it's been fascinating. But I think my argument is more like this hasn't really been adopted in in from a practitioner standpoint to the same degree that it's in in research. And I I agree. Like there there are certain barriers. Um, to rule in this auto ML and, and, and various aspects of neural architecture search out, um, you know, in a wider perspective. So, you know, that's what I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to um, realize over the, the coming five years. Well, we, we've got to give SEC something to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. so it was an easy well, all good topics. Right. Yeah. Right. No, I, I think it's, it's incredibly important. I mean, we shouldn't lose sight. Why has there been such a renaissance in machine learning and deep learning since Hinton's work from 2012 onward with you know, ImageNet? It's, wow, you know, new multi-core architectures, whether GPU, TPU, or you name it, it's been, you know, one of the main catalysts. Now we realize uh -huh. algorithmically there's so much more that could be done, right? In terms Absolutely. Of optimization. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good segue to optimization in general. Let's, let's dive into this. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, uh, you, know, you know, how many bits of precision, what kind of pruning architectures you have. And I'm curious, generally, what optimization approach do you think is the most critical uh, as we think about edge applications and trying to minimize the footprint, but maximize the accuracy? Let me let Graham go first. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> hogging this. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, in, in, you know, in terms of all these different strategies, like even within neural architecture search, you know, there's, there's random search and there's genetic algorithms and there's um, you know, differentiable approaches, and um, you know, there's there's all these you know, all these options. People have done reinforcement learning, and there's also different strategies to doing architecture design. You know, maybe it be pruning or or quantization. And I, I 
I think it's impossible to say what is the best. Like, I think we can have all these um, different approaches, but it's going to be up to uh, the search or the optimization to discover what's right for the particular application. We've already gone through a whole bunch of different exciting applications, and I think um, we're going to have a person design what uh, criteria are important in terms of the outcome. We're going to discuss the constraints in that domain, and then we're going to have an algorithm be able to search over the the uh, the, the space of strategies and, and including architectures and other sort of hyperparameters associated with that solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think Graham and I just hopped across other sides of the whole fence because I'd say that that kind of automation is out there in the future somewhere. But, but, but for now, I guess to get directly to the question, if, if, I, if I had one hammer with which to optimize a neural net, uh, independent of the application area, I would use quantization. Um, we can control it in a way to minimize the impact. Uh, we can we can count on it uh, reducing memory. We can pretty much count on it accelerating the computation if if there's some intelligent compiler support. Um, and and it's not any we can we can out of the box use it for computer vision, speech recognition, natural language processing recommendations. Um, Pruning is another candidate, but it can often have computational side effects uh, so that you, you think you're reducing the computation a lot. And then when, because you can't schedule it as well or pack it as well, then, then you actually slow things down. And that's always depressing. And distillation can be very powerful, but it works on some things, natural language processing, perhaps a lot better than other things like computer vision. So, so I'm, I'm putting my chips on, on, on quantization for now, although, but but I think Graham's got an excellent point is that the systems that we really want will be able to make those decisions for us. And, and I think uh, both Kurt and Graham, I think you, you pointed to the thing, it's, it's not a solution that kind of solves everything, but it's really providing the developer, the AI scientists, the, the tools in which to do all these things, that the tools themselves are, you know, beyond just a single paper, you know, and this kind of data set, but really robust tools that, uh, developers can then use, right? It's all toolkits that one can take the AI into the next form. You, you mentioned something interesting. You said, regardless of application, quantization might be the best lever. And I'm curious if you think the answer will be somewhat similar across all domains, meaning, you know, a sweet spot after a bunch of work that says eight bit is it or one or two, or do you think there'll be some feedback loop in the course of development and accuracy where, you know, you, you have some guidance as to where to head if it's not the same answer for all. Oh, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, this is this has been one of our focal points of research. You know, we, we've done a lot, some original uh, neural net model development with the squeeze family, but I think where we've, where we've really thought the hardest is on how to apply quantization. And so it's not just a matter of one size fits across all or one size fits for an application area, we we actually look at the the, the lost landscape of the function, and we, we we change the bit precision layer by layer through a network, and mm -hmm. and that's that's how we're we're able to minimize the number of bits, uh, but but retain the accuracy that, that that most of our customers are you know are, are really stuck to. Is this both training and deployment, or are you talking primarily? So we're principally focusing on deployment, but you know that. Uh, and you, in bringing up training, to get to retain that accuracy, if you want to really guarantee, you need to do incremental retraining as as you go. So it's the training and, and optimization are very interlinked. Although we have done some some work on on zero shot quantization because you don't always have the training data. Maybe it's private. Maybe your group just doesn't have access to it. And what do you think about quantization? Yeah. I, my perspective on this is that um, we've also worked on this this idea of using mixed precision within an architecture, and uh, particularly looking at this on the training side, and and maybe the the regularization benefits of of uh, training with different precision levels. Um, we've looked at the pros and cons of using reduced uh, precision. I think this is again it, it, in terms of squeezing the last bit of performance out of an out of an architecture. This this can be a very useful tool, but what has what has to be balanced is the, the programming model or the, the 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 practitioner experience. And I think for a lot of deep learning applications, 
general rules like 16-bit uh, float endpoint for training models and 8-bit integer deployment for a lot of inference it, it generally useful. And we see these, these data types built in to common frameworks and available to everyday users. So mm -hmm. again, I think it's, a, it's really a, a, a trade-off. I um, mean, it goes again back to these objectives. Is it purely accuracy? Um, we might have the opportunity to discuss things like uh, the relationship between precision and, and robustness um, as, as well, um, robustness to how to distribution yeah, examples yeah. or adversaries, right? I was going to say, what, what is your opinion on that and robustness? Well, we, we had done some work a, a, a few years ago on the relationship between quantization and, and robustness, and there can be some opportunities uh, that not only you get a memory advantage of reducing down to a low bit width, but you also would gain some some robustness. But this also required uh, some elements of the architecture, namely batch normalization, that may impact uh, robustness in a negative way. So the jury's not uh, completely out on that. There are, there are other benefits too of quantization, um, and I, I think it's really cool that Kurt said you know, that could be one one very very useful tool in a in a practitioner's toolbox. Um, another one with quantization is the ability to estimate mutual information. So there's there's been a lot of recent work that uses mutual information estimation within neural nets for different kinds of purposes. Right now, we're looking on it as a possible way of quanta, uh, quantifying the compression benefit uh, towards robustness. And people have pointed out, if you can quantize a net, you can efficiently uh, compute its mutual information. So that's another side product or side benefit of, of quantization. Just, I'm just curious. I mean, is the is there a theory for why a lower bit length could be more robust as opposed to one might assume less? Like, is it like an overfitting kind of theory that's being avoided, or what is the reason for that? One way to describe some of what was happening in that work was the uh, way we compute. We we use this stochastic operator inside the net. Um, and I think this, a lot of strategies for say attacking a net uh, make it uh, require you to be able to compute gradients through that network. So doing quantization in particular, the types of stochastic quantization operators we were using made it difficult. Um, so, it, so one thing about this work that we've realized sort of a few years later is there you, you have to decouple uh, the notion of sort of gradient masking and the benefit that's coming purely from quantization. And this is, this is an option uh, opportunity for future work as well to understand is, is it sort of a gradient masking, masking type, of, type of behavior or uh, is there something else associated with quantization that is, that is useful for gaining robustness? Interesting. I, maybe just one little sub point on this whole topic is I'm curious what each of you thinks about the ideal bits that one should be exploring, you know, and it, sort of this high level question is an 8 bit integer enough, you know, you think about the optimization for register files and, you know, binary architectures as we know them. Then there was some interesting work, you know, with XNOR, the one bit approach that had, you know, extremely you know, blindingly flash computation, remarkably small bit precision uh, that Apple purchased. Um, but I'm curious in between like 5 bit, 4 bit, 9 bit, you know, is there any sweet spot other than 8 bit <laughs> that excites you? Well, I think, you know, the, we're feel pretty strongly the layer by layer, you know, each, each layer will require a certain precision. And I, you know, I would, would try to show with my hands a little bit, but if you have a very flat loss landscape associated with a layer, then obviously quantization using fewer bits doesn't change much. If you have a very sharp loss landscape, then moving just a little bit, you can be very sensitive and so forth. And that's, that's a layer by layer property. So there's, um, we're at the opposite extreme of one size fits all. Um, mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with Graham uh, that a lot, you know, so many people out there are like, I've got enough problems worrying about bit precision is not one that I want to add to it. But again, I, you know, point again to sec. I mean, I think there's no reason to debate about this in theory. If, if a tool could do this with some automation, mm -hmm. We, we would want to use it. And, and, and we're seeing uh, increasing uh, computational support for, for bit precision, like four bits, which, which people were laughing about just a few years ago, but NVIDIA has led the way other companies are following in terms of support for that. And then, and then you just get a you know, linear speed up with, with, the, with, the, with these bit precision, this you know, 2x as you go from eight, eight to four or, or more. Mm -hmm. And nibble, a nibble is as good as a bite. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think that's going to be the tagline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I see that there's opportunities, right? Once you shrink the, the model, you know, to kind of odd lengths, even like, you know, uh, three bits rather than four, and you want to mask it up to, to four bits, you have the opportunity to put something in there as well. It could be uh, some sort of uh, robustness kind of criteria that you added, right? Um, you can kind of wiggle it enough so that it is more robust. It kind of defines the uh, classification kind of switching points, for example. Uh, you can put uh, signatures and what have you within the, the, the network uh, set of weights and, 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 and such. So we have not really just explored that aspect of it, right? We, mm -hmm. we talked about shrinking, quantization for performance sake, for latency sake. But once you open the door and says, okay, you can guarantee an accuracy, you can guarantee this level of precision, then the question is, what can you do with it? And, and there's a whole lot of, I think, other criteria, data privacy and things that you start to now insert in, and then you add much more uh, features and capability uh, beyond the kind of things that we uh, easily kind of uh, adopt to, right? Interesting, interesting. Well, this, this talk of bits of precision does relate pretty intimately at times with the physical architecture, the chips that you're operating on, this sort of thing we take for granted that, you know, support for four bit or eight bit, um, you know, operands and, and compute and getting a physical speed up from what one might imagine if you were dealing with custom silicon comes sometimes against the harsh reality of well, what is the silicon you're running on. So maybe we can shift to your thoughts on the hardware landscape and how it's changing. I'll, I'll share my, my point of view, which is, you know, when I saw Hinton's work uh, and, and sort of this renaissance, the first investment area we really went for was actually uh, dedicated silicon to accelerate AI and ML. It has just occurred to us that most compute will shift to this and GPUs are nice and they open their eyes to how they can be better than a CPU, but there's still a lot closer mimics to cortical structures and how the brain works that are possible. And so we invested in Nirvana, which Intel acquired in Nvidia's. More recently, Mythic, as I mentioned, doing analog compute, even more analogous to the brain, one could argue. Um, and there's all kinds of other research agendas that I'm less enthusiastic about, but I know there's work going on in a variety of different ways to either, either go down the path of biomimicry or certainly tons of companies, like I might estimate there's 70 or 80 companies who had a common insight of, hey, let's just have a lot of distributed memory, um, a large number of compute units, um, some sort of switch fabric, maybe from the network processor era and build a custom chip that does machine learning really well. And really that's what it's optimized for. A lot of matrix multiply and add, if you will, over and over and over again. And I'm curious if, if that sums it up in your mind as well, if there's some new things you're seeing coming down the pipe over the next five years, let's say, or just now hitting our shores, whether that's the TPU or the Tesla jo dojo like chips or Cerebras or others who are you know, really pushing uh, vectors in new directions of, of scale and, and scope, or if it's something kind of wonky and new like analog compute or quantum machine learning or what have you, is there something that excites you on the hardware side? Well, first I think it's, it's often, you know, uh, it's good to se segregate the cloud and the client here. And mm -hmm. uh, I, boy, you know, known NVIDIA since its inception, I would hate to be competing with those guys in the, in the cloud, you know, or, or Intel for that matter. Um, and moreover, every major uh, potential customer that you have, the people I rattled off earlier, Alibaba, Amazon, Facebook, Google, so forth, well, they all have either successful efforts like Google, or they have multiple competing efforts inside underway. And those are the people who are going to be, in, 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 you know, um, evaluating your product. So, so I'll, I'll leave that to, to somebody else. But I see a lot of potential uh, at the edge. Um, there, you know, just, just you said it just right, Steve. There's so much we can trim away from, from a GPU when we're attacking a particular ad application, uh, be it in the car, in the home, in my Alexa unit, or so forth here. And so, I, you know, I, I think that's really exciting. And I think that brings the potential for very close work between the kind of optimizations that we're describing here. The application, on the one hand, the, the software uh, flow and, and the optimizations that we're talking about. And then finally, the, you know, things like the bit precision, the hardware. Now, I, I do think that at the end of the day, I'm, you know, I think we're going to see a Mac array. You know, we're, we're, we're not, we're not going to see analog units. Uh, sorry, mythic, but uh, we're, we're going to see it. We're going to see a good old, good old fashioned uh, Mac array because so much of the problem is actually getting the data in and out 
it's not doing that little multiply accumulate once you, once you get it there. Well, you, be exactly, you mean not a multiply accumulate array or no i i, I do say yeah. it will be a multiply accumulate array because even if if somebody comes in and says well just look how i can do that so much more efficient in analog i will say yeah but let's look let's let's look at this holistically and and how long did it take you to get that in there and out versus how long did it take you to do the multiply accumulate so it's really the data flow Oh, for sure. If, if you want to improve something, indeed, a or whatever your interfaces are, absolutely. No, you can't just look at a look at like you know, wait for probing somewhere you can't access in a chip and say that's faster. And of course, it has to be at a at a system level. Holistic, yeah, yeah. But and I could be wrong. By the way, and it can have massive like hundred x power advantages too. So sometimes it's is it accuracy, is it power? You know, how are you training people off? You know, yeah. Graham, how about you? I think I'll talk more abstractly about what I'd like to see in hardware based on recent discussions uh, with, with one of my PhD students and, and, and related to some of the projects we've been doing. So something we're quite excited about in, in our lab is this notion of conditional com computation. So this is the idea that you know, a lot of common architectures effectively uh, exert the same amount of computation regardless of input you present to them. But you can have a different model, which you call compu conditional computation, where you have a variable amount of compute expended depending on the input. So a classic example is a network that considers its confidence in a prediction and decides to early exit a network at an earlier layer because it has high confidence of say what class that, that image presented to it represents. But you can take this a step further and, and um, we've been looking at this idea of ephemeral sparsity in networks. So ephemeral sparsity is sort of like per input sparsity, the sparsity pattern changes. And this could be as simple as something like ReLU units, you know, that are turning off and presenting a certain sparsity pattern. But there's this notion that ephemeral sparsity can yield opportunities for conditional computation, right? Because the network, depending on the sparsity pattern that emerges, whether this be in sort of feed forward nets with ReLUs or they be transformers with sparse attention, um, it can yield patterns of sparsity that can be exploited for conditional computation. And the hardware that supports this uh, would be very powerful combined with these architectures. So it's sort of like architecture supporting the hardware, hardware supporting these architectures um, and getting away from the model of exuding the same amount of computation for every single input. I um, love this. this. This to me is really fascinating. The idea, of, if I'm understanding you, a whole bunch of dynamic runtime in a way either ramping up or ramping down the amount of compute based on input needs. Like the, the, Exactly. The, People think, call it dynamic uh, inference as well. Right. Yeah. Imagine exactly. a security camera with this really massive facial recognition algorithm in place. It doesn't need to be running all the time. First, you can do, is there anything changing in the frame? You know, mine's quote semi-sleep mode. And then ramp up the moment you start to recognize anything that looks like a humanoid. And then you really zoom in and, and, and turn more on, if you will, if, if their face is to be recognized. Um, yeah, the, the, only, the, only, the only footnote I, I would put to that is that the granularity is very important. So for me, as something of a, of a computational connoisseur, and this is kind of like a dream come true that we have these statically schedulable computations and, and yeah, you can say, well, they, they do the same thing all the time. I don't know, that sounds like a really good thing to me if I'm, if I'm trying to optimize that because I can predictably know when things are happening. So uh, the kind of things you're, you're talking about in terms of wake up, the time things like you're, we're, we're gonna we're going to we can just stop the computation now because we're done. This is enough accuracy. All that sounds great. We start monkeying around layer by layer. Okay, well we could we could drop this channel out. Oh, we could, you know, as to the discussion before, you really got to make sure you look all the way through. Okay, how does how does that price out holistically in terms of the, the flow of the computation? And are we now turning what used to be a nice dense high utilization computation in, into something that, that's beginning to look more like a graph algorithm and we're, we're, we're jumping around, we're getting very poor utilization of our hardware. I, I think that that's the, the crux of it. There's a lot of things that we can do with statically kind of define uh, networks. We can train to it, or we can build hardware and a lot of different practical hardware and, and applications that we can drive towards, right? Uh, the conditional computing is, is interesting. We've, we've looked at it as well. Uh, but it also needs a little bit of push on the hardware side to get to that kind of optimal kind of stage. Uh, I look at it as an opportunity where uh, if you look at a lot of the hardware that's built, you know, uh, you know, prior to a lot of these neural network uh, workloads, they do a lot of dynamic kind of uh, things, the dynamic scheduling and things like that, right? They do things well at runtime. Uh, it would be nice to have that coupled with uh, some of the neural network uh, processing where we say, okay, I can sleep uh, some of these units because I don't need them. I can actually throttle things up and down. That needs a lot of more hardware support. 
So it becomes a chicken and egg thing as well. Like, do you have models that can define it such that it, it can be trained that way and run that way? And then is there hardware? And which one comes first, right, to, to get it to that spot? Uh, so there's practical things that we, uh, Lena, are we addressing because there is interesting applications to get out. Then there's these kind of new things that we are looking forward to uh, as it comes down. Well, I also think you know we 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 talk very application agnostically across this, but but if you if you look at computer vision, speech recognition, natural language natural language understanding, and oh my God, may, someday we may want to be able to do a bit of recommendation system at the edge. All these have very different arithmetic intensity, different kind mm -hmm. of uh, the intensity of the, the number of computation to the memory pool. And so for some of these, it's it's a lot, you know, we're talking a lot about computation, but it's a lot more about the, the memory flow and the data flow through the system than it is, you know, how, how many Macs are you doing on this, this particular layer? Interesting. Well, I am uh, sensitive to the time, and I think perhaps we shift to our last question, uh, which will ask each of you to look to the future, either from the framework of a researcher, what's most exciting you, or as an investor on the side, or you get advice from me as an investor um, on what I should be looking for specifically, what's next in Edge AI from your point of view that will be exciting and uh, you know, that's something that future history books might be written about. Well, Steve, can I can I take over the panel for a moment? Because you're you're jumping over the question that I wanted to ask for you. You know, oh, sure. the question here is the industry ready for the edge? When no. what, what are some of the challenges? And I thought, you know, that's a question for Steve Jerwitzen, not for not for Kirk Kreutzer. And I, I'd love to hear what you say about that because you know, I sit here deep in the technology and think, God, there's so much we can do. Infrastructure, there's so much we could do with the infrastructure of San Francisco. It's safer for driving. Is it gonna happen? Right. Well, I don't know. Probably not. Right. So, yeah. what what do we need to do? What, oh, how, how yeah, I, no, I specifically skipped this question because it's a rough one. It's uh, I think we have this enormous rift between obvious potential and impact that we all know that every researcher in the field knows. This almost palpable excitement about the near future, and then this frustration on how do we get from here to there. And if you think about uh, autonomous driving, is something that everyone you know listening to this can relate to okay, we can make progress. We can imagine starting at a certain level of capability, getting to a better level of capability in the future. How do you roll it out? When are consumers comfortable trusting their lives to this edge AI? Um, when are regulators comfortable in it? What, how many mishaps statistically can one have um, before potentially having political backlash? How do you factor that into your risk assessment? So think about that one in some level of depth in a imagine you could formulate the go-to-market strategy like Tesla and others have had to do. It's, it's sort of the same problem writ large for just about everything. If you're a consumer electronics company, you're Apple, you're Samsung, you name it. Um, when do you feel comfortable putting AI in a billion of your products, or let's say a few hundred million, knowing that it has a huge impact on the user experience and to what extent are we going to tolerate the occasional mistake for a 99% plus you know, improvement or benefit? How do you communicate notions around privacy? And you think about um, some of the first experiences people had with Siri uh, it's either spooky or magical, a little of both, and then it quickly wears off and it just becomes annoying. And then you expect more, you explore, expect more from your Alexa. But we know, like, like as an investor, here's what I do. I know that 500 years from now, it is unfathomable that we won't have an AI agent in everything. Every product could be a little better if it was smarter. Uh, and so these chips, you know, it'll cost five to 10 cents in the not too distant future. Um, certainly the analog ones will, <laughs> one other reason to consider them. Um, or something that, uh, that you would naturally build into everything. Then you have product life cycles. Automotive used to be seven years. Consumer electronics has its own special you know, march of death in terms of you know, incorporating any new radical technology at a component level if you're trying to sell to an iPhone maker. So what I'm sharing is there's a lot of industry inertia slash hmm, challenges as an investor to anything that touches consumer electronics, anything that touches high volume physical goods. Yet the irony is, Every one of those products is going through transformation like the iPhone went through, right? Where it used to be a clunky thing where the buttons made a difference and the, user, the physical design mattered and you had flip phones and you had the razor to they're all exactly the same. They're just a screen and a gateway to software and services. That is what the automotive experience is becoming with the screen and software and services. Uh, at least Tesla realizes that and the rest of the automotive industry is slowly catching up. That's what every product and service is becoming over time, you know, a software and information services rich thing. So while on one hand, it's perhaps the largest, you know, thing happening in IT consuming majority of compute cycles inevitably in the future, 
it's we're in that early phase of the industry where there's a lot of missteps and stumbles, a lot of older companies who are conservative and adopting new technologies. Like, I mean, even companies that ostensibly sell AI, like, a, you know, like iRobot for Roomba, you know, how often do they introduce something radically new and different, right? And so my personal view is, as with everything, if it's an exciting, new, meaningful change, it'll be led by a new entrant. And so I really don't even care what large companies are doing. Um, I'm looking for the next startup, whether it be a security camera startup, you know, Thomas Driving Stack, you name it, somebody who's going to push that envelope forward, uh, who's not currently in that business. And um and I don't know. The answer is this is why it's not a. This is why I think money can be made as for as a, as an investment domain. If the answer to your question was obvious, then it would be a public market SPAC riddled yeah. investment thesis already, and a little too late for us. And so this is why I am actively looking to invest. In fact, we have more edge AI investments than any other category in our firm. Um, if I if I try to categorize things, we have a lot of one of a kinds. That's what we try to do in general. But there's if I was to group anything. We have the most in this area. Um, and I think, you know, you look at, you know, farmers wanting smarter tractors and smarter ways of deploying precision, uh, you know, sprays of fertilizer or pesticides just to use droplets instead of sprays over everything. It, it's just everywhere you look, the product or service could be more efficient, more sustainable, more environmentally friendly. Uh, and frankly, I mean, if you just think about it in quote marks, just more intelligent. Right? Like, wouldn't you want whatever your product or service is to just be more intelligent? And so, uh, in a long-winded way, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I just, I just yeah. got to have a follow-up though. So, how do you balance your? I mean, you clearly you're a visionary investor and a thesis-driven investor with business reality. You know, how, how, just briefly sharing you, how, how how does a guy like you do that? Oh, he's in general. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, in general, I try to do two things, and I try to hold every entrepreneur to this pair of seemingly opposing desires. One is paint a picture of the inevitable future. 500 years from now, everything will be like, you know, all cars will be electric, all cars will be autonomous, all vehicles will be autonomous. We will not burn oil and gas. This is sort of obvious, right? That is the 500-year future. Now chain back to the present. Tell me how, given what you're trying to do, it's the most likely way to connect with that future that we know will happen, right? Whether we're trying to change how we manufacture meat, change how we do sustainable transport, you name it, right? Um, and so that answer usually is, oh, we're gonna iterate with real customers to get to there. We're not gonna hunker down for 10 years, pop up with a solution to all the world's problems, right? We're gonna literally next year or the year after, maybe at most, have a customer who's giving us revenue to help us show us the way. Because that dance with the market is usually the answer to your question, where I don't know, like that's why I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't have the, Here's the answer of how we go to market with edge AI. But I know that talking to a bunch of entrepreneurs working on this problem, something's gonna click where someone else will figure it out. Like, you know, here's a customer need today that then once we take that beachhead, we'll get all the other customers comfortable that we've deployed thousands and millions of customers and now we'll go to the billions because you've done it. Usually in some industrial lower volume, higher gross margin application, right? You go somewhere where your sales effort on the front end is recouped by a higher price per unit on the back end you get the installed base and proof points, and then you go mass market, right? In a, in a very crude, loose way, kind of like the Tesla Roadster with a you know a few thousand customers in total sets the stage for the Model S, which then sets the stage for the Model 3. Um, there's this inevitable comfort as you go to the mass market that your early adopters you know, take you there. So classic business and technology investing. But um, in this domain, I think... There's a lot of customer friction around human capital. And we touched upon that earlier, which is, okay, great. Whatever we're talking about, who's going to actually implement this at my firm? If I work for a, frankly, less than exciting firm on the recruiting side, I work at an insurance company. I work at, you name it, right? It's not Tesla. It's not SpaceX. You know, who can attract the best and the brightest, right? And the best graduates from, from AI programs. Because the human skill in, in machine learning, deep learning, in my opinion, is hugely fungible. These people go anywhere. Do you want to cure cancer? Do you want to save the earth with earth solid imaging? You pick it because your domain of expertise can be used at any of these places, right? Or you can go into the great mob of Google and Facebook and, you know, optimize advertising networks, you know, for a living, which is the least inspiring, I think, application of this. Um, my point is just, the, there's a lot of demand across all industry sectors for a sparse, surprisingly, number of, you know, humans that can do this really well. And so I think automated tools on ML ops, on optimization of training modalities and deployment modalities is really one of the big missing pieces. It's like, how can we 
relieve the human bottleneck such that every industry can more confidently approach uh, ML development and deployment. Um, so we're trying to invest in those things as well. I think that's what Leighton AI specifically speaks to for you know, a huge category of customers and there'll, and there'll be more. There'll be people who are focusing just on the enterprise cloud deployment side and on training. There'll be others focusing on, you know, in a sense, all the other services and uh, adjunct sort of handholding the customers will need on <laughs> converting their thinking from traditional engineering to more like parenting and building something that's not fully understood soup to nuts, but yet is more powerful than anything they've seen before. That's the future we're heading to. It's sort of this leap of faith that I think many in the engineering domain have to make. Thanks. Thanks for that. Absolutely. Well, then, if we still have time, maybe just ending, because I'd rather end with your thoughts. Uh, if there's anything next that you're excited about, either a new research agenda, uh, Hinton, by the way, last I spoke to him, he was really interested in you know, coincidence detection and memory structures in, in neural nets. I thought that was fascinating uh, as a way to further mimic the human brain. But I'm curious if either on the research side or on the domain slash investor slash business side, if there's anything that you want to leave us with that you think is you know coming down the pipe. I can get started. I, I, I'll, I'll give you sort of a, a boring short <laughs> answer and then like uh, maybe a less obvious answer. So the, the boring short one is like, I'm tired of always charging my device. So I'm hoping to see revolutionary development and battery technology to go along with edge AI. I mm. mean, these things have to go together. Uh, so, you know, I'm very excited about further advances in energy and compute mm -hmm. uh, and maybe, you know, combinations between the two of them as we've seen. Uh, and also the sort of maybe less obvious one is getting away from cameras everywhere in our homes or microphones everywhere in our home. I think there is developing resistance to that. And so thinking about alternative sensing technologies that can be fed as inputs to deep learning systems. So for example, a few years ago, we worked with uh, carbon dioxide sensors, which have actually been very, come very popular in COVID times. And everybody's carrying them on the planes now, um, interestingly enough. But uh, we were able to get good, accurate estimates of, um, say, number of people in a room or a particular environment. But I've also seen very amazing things done, for example, at MIT on, on using wireless spectra to reason about people's activities. So I, I am quite excited about these sort of alternative uh, sensors and how they might be uh, used. There might be different use cases for those. Interesting. So let me rattle off a few things. So, so first, in terms of research, and I, I can't say this is something, and we're doing we're doing work in this, but I can't say we're we're the superstars. But I mean, clearly, generalization and the ability to that if this model was trained, you know, in downtown San Francisco, it's not going to completely you know fall apart if if we take it to Detroit. You know, that's uh, say for an autonomous vehicle. That's that the ability to generalize and quickly generalize to environments. I think that's that's a huge. Uh, research challenge. Um, but I think we've accomplished a lot over these last five or six years. And so I think one thing I'm really excited about the number of companies that will be putting together different pieces and so forth. And, you know, forcing Dole and I, before we started deep scale, we, we thought of, we, had, we must've gone through 35 different potential applications of computer vision on the whiteboard. And there's a company out there doing every one of those and doing every one of those successfully, right? So, so we're, we're really seeing an explosion and, and, and that's, that's, that's very exciting. And I think then the next step is, you know, integrating computer vision, with, with speech, with natural language understanding. I think VR headsets will be a great place to demonstrate that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll, we'll see that integration. I think that's gonna be very exciting, very challenging for, for those of us working at the edge. But the, the thing that, that, that to me is a little bit the holy grail is the, is the personal assistant. You know, I mean, I just look at how much I do in a day, particularly around email, other everyday tasks. And then of course, all the stuff brings you back to computer. And then, you know, once you're at the computer, well, you know, <laughs> hours later, you're finally excavating yourself back back out of that. And so how much of this this that I do in a day now that electronics has made it so easy to, to, to send me an email to 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 solicit my attention? How much of that can I can I just manage with a personal assistant? You know, and doing that well, that that I think is 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 you know the holy grail that I, that I that I'm looking for. Yeah, that's interesting because I had the same kind of thought. Where if we are doing quantization, we're shrinking a lot of these models. Then these models are small, efficient, they're very nimble. You can have a number of these run even on the same device, and mm -hmm. then all they're doing is just setting context, right? 
that helps you, you know, if you need to answer the email right away, you know, it tells you, right? You kind of decide. So it's, it's the new set of application where we revisit a lot of these things where now that your models are small, what can you do better? We can actually go back to that. Uh, we can look at even uh, cross sensor modality, what Graham is talking about, right? If one sensor leaves off the other, that can drive context to run a heavier model, for example. So there's a lot of opportunities once we get into a, uh, a scheme where the tooling allows you to have robust uh, compressed models, they're running super efficient. Okay, what would you do? Maybe have a number of these things run on a single device. And then you'll be choosy in terms of should I run this version or that version or this model because I, I understand the context needs it, right? Um, so I think the application will be much more robust, much more intelligent due to, to do the intelligent things. Um, so I'm looking forward for that day, right? Where, where we right. have not only just one model, but actually a plethora of model to choose from because each one of them uh, will be efficient. Now, Zach, this is a, a great point to end on. And uh, I, I'm smiling because I thought of something funny looking at your names lined across here as the, you know, the dream team of Edge AI. And so rather than DreamWorks SKG, which you all know, there is Neural Networks SKG, which is Sec, Kurt, and Graham. And so here you are. Um, and thank you so much for your insights today. I'm glad you shared them with us and we were able to uh, bounce them off each other and uh, look forward to a, a bold future together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.